So before I make a formal introduction of our keynote speaker, Ken Ender, would you like to say a few words about him? Thanks, Rick. I, um, first of all, I want to continue to thank all of you all that have come uh, to help us think about this plan, who've come from other parts of the country and from other institutions. I mean, you give up a ton of your time, and you know who you are, and you just really inform and help us make this plan better. <clears throat> I've known Josh Weiner for, I guess, about six years. Josh, among other things, um, leads the Aspen Institute's discovery of the recipient of the Aspen Prize. For the, um, some have interpreted the prize as the best community college in America. I've chosen not to make that interpretation because we have not been awarded the prize. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fair to say that those that do win the prize win it because they make significant improvement in reducing achievement gaps among high-risk students. And while we're making progress, yesterday I shared that we weren't where we wanted to be, and we're going to keep working on that. Despite all of this, Josh is still really a good friend and a guy that I look to um, for deep conversations, thoughtful conversations about the business that we're in, the community college, the sector, both as an industry and as a um, catalyst, if you will, for change, particularly with respect to social issues and issues of equity. And Josh is one of the best thinkers I know of in that space. So we really worked hard to get him here, and frankly, I really am surprised he is here, because yesterday he was in California, and to make this trip possible, he had to arrive here from California at 11.30 last night, and is gonna leave pretty quickly after he finishes to get back to Washington and do some work. Now, Josh, I'm not saying that to get you off the hook with our recipient of the prize, but I, it's the only way I know how to adequately express how thankful we are that you have given up your time to be with us, and it means a lot as an institution uh, for you to send us that signal. So thank you so much. And Rick, if you'd make the formal introduction. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. So um, as if he needs further introduction, let me go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, Joshua Weiner is Vice President and Executive Director of the College Excellence Program at the Aspen Institute. This program is, uh, it, it highlights exceptional community colleges, works to align the hiring and professional development of college presidents with the goal of improving student success. Josh has spent the past two decades as a nonprofit leader in education, recently authoring a book, What Excellent Community Colleges Do, Preparing All Students for Success from the Harvard Education Press. He has a BA in history from Vassar College, a master's in public administration from Syracuse, and a JD from the New York School of Law. Joshua, thanks so much for being with us today, and please welcome Joshua. Well, thank you, um, and thank you, Ken. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be here. This is my favorite thing to do, is come be with colleges. And, even better if I can spend a couple of days and really learn how you do what you do. Um, I lead the higher education programs at the Aspen Institute, and I really appreciate Ken talking a little bit about what drives me. I, um, just a little autobiographical note, I grew up going to the Harlem and DC public schools, and I was fortunate to have college-educated parents, but not fortunate enough to be sent to schools that prepared me for success. I arrived at Vassar College as a physics major, and was, um, I guess, scandalously is probably the, uh, the right word, scandalously underprepared. Within a semester, I knew I couldn't handle the work. I had um, been a straight A student and never challenged at the level that I was being challenged in college. And so I became a history major, and I've had no regrets, you know, uh, although I still like to think scientifically and did cost modeling and some other things earlier in my career that followed that passion, but, but what I was deeply aware of at the time was having been at majority-minority schools all the way through my life and having tutored students starting in the 10th grade who were college senior, uh, high school seniors who couldn't 
really couldn't read beyond a fifth or sixth grade, grade level. I knew that those kids who were every bit as smart as I was, who were failed and lied to by their K-12 systems, who were told that whatever grade they got was good enough to get out of school, that they weren't prepared. Now, I wasn't prepared to be a physics major at Vassar College, which is different than not being prepared for, um, for some other things. But the fact of the matter is that I had the social capital, the knowledge, the whatever grit had been imbued in me, or just the, just the expectation that I was going to finish college. And all those kids that I graduated with, uh, or didn't graduate, who were going on to get their GEDs, I can say now, all those kids would have dropped out. The minute they sat in those classes, and, and by the way, people say these small liberal arts colleges are going to take care of you. I, nobody knew I switched majors. Nobody knew I couldn't do the work. They, you know, I, I got a C in math, declared fi in calculus, declared physics major. Nobody came to visit me. So we think that these colleges are watching students. They're really not. The fact of the matter is that in higher education, we are not changing what we do to have the kind of growth mindset that we need to enable students to succeed. And for somebody like me, it meant going from a physics major to a history major, and I figured it out somewhere around junior year. If you look at my transcript, I would rather you not look at the first two years. But for these other students who arrived in colleges that might not have had the supports or the small classes, or as importantly, you didn't come from backgrounds as I did, where both my parents were college educated. It was the difference between succeeding and not succeeding. And so a huge amount, a big part of the reason that uh, I came to Aspen to start the higher education programs and why we focus on community colleges is for that reason, is because we are working with students who, if, if we don't succeed with them, they're not going to navigate the system themselves. They're not going to figure out there's something they might be able to succeed in. They're just going to leave. So we started the Aspen uh, higher education programs four years ago, and we deliberately started with community colleges because you're doing the work with the populations who are at most at risk of, of uh, falling out. Um, so we run something called the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence, and it is an excuse for a deep research project into what works in community colleges. There's a lot of really good research going on. Um, the Community College Research Center is doing, I rely on them hugely to do terrific work on all sorts of programs of, of study. Uh, MDRC is doing random assignment uh, trials. Uh, uh, there's, there's work coming, practice work coming out of Achieving the Dream, out of a, a number of different places. Uh, the SESI uh, is doing really good work. What we hope to add to the conversation is what does institutional excellence look like? Not programmatic excellence, but institutional excellence. And that's a different question. So that's what we really aim to do, and we start with over 1,000 colleges, we look at data, and I know the limitations of iPads. We brought 25 data people together, uh, co-led actually by Bill Truehart and, uh, 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 in our data panel, um, but people from AACC and Tom Bailey was there. We figured out the best way of assessing colleges. And we start with over 1,000, and we're looking at data. And then we whittle back, and we end up with a winner who we will be announcing next week in DC. Um, so we're now at the 10 finalist stage. Um, so these are the winners that we've uh, announced in past years, Santa Barbara, Valencia, and Walla Walla, and you can see other colleges that have been recognized over the first two cycles of the prize. These include the 10 finalists. Um, so what is our theory of what makes a college excellence? When we brought all these people together, we asked, well, what is college excellence? What is community college excellence? What does it look like? And we really decided that there were four things. This is not four different definitions of excellence. This is a four-part definition of excellence. So one is learning. At the core of what you do is learning. And for those of you who um, have read the literature, you've seen um, probably that we have a challenge in, across higher education, which is that grades are going up and rigor seems to be coming down. That's probably not a great combination, right? We're signaling to students that they're learning more and more, and across higher education, we know that the amount of rigor is coming down. And, there are a lot of different studies. Half of college graduates can't read a, uh, an op-ed and draw meaning from it, appropriate meaning. Uh, that was from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Academically Adrift, a book talked about limited growth in critical thinking for college students. This is across all of colleges. NCEE put a report out specifically about community college English courses lacking rigor. So we've got to make sure that students are learning 
and learning more. And, and the value of learning is, as I'll talk about in a moment, in terms of getting a job, but it's also for citizenship. It's also for being able to participate. It's also for being able to teach your kids how to think critically, right? And all of those things are going to perpetuate uh, our society and the, the strength of, of, of our society. Um, the second is completion. Uh, we know that about 40% of community college students graduate or transfer. Um, at the four-year level, it's not that much better. It's in the 50s, high 50s. Um, and so, you know, overall, one out of two students isn't finishing. The data are incredibly clear. It is much better to finish than not to finish a degree. Uh, thirdly, labor market outcomes. We want to make sure that what you've learned and what you've completed has value after you graduate. And there are two places community college students go after they graduate, right? They go directly into the workforce or they go on to transfer. So when we look at labor market outcomes, sometimes we're looking for intermediate outcomes, transfer and bachelor's completion, and uh, sometimes we're looking directly into the labor market. But in every case, whether it's through transfer or not, students want jobs. As Tony Carnevale likes to say, you know, the, the, the goal of higher education is to live more fully in your time. Um, it's hard to live more fully in your time when you're living under a bridge. I mean, you know, this is the bottom line here, which is that you, it, it's, it's, so it is not okay for students to graduate with a credential in a minimum wage job that they could have gotten uh, with, uh, with a high school diploma. Um, it, that's not what they're aiming for. Um, and then finally, equitable outcomes. Um, the statistic that's most striking to me is that in the year 2020 in our country, 12% uh, um, uh, of all high school graduates were Hispanic, Latino. 12%. In the year 2020, anybody know what the number is going to be? 25%. That's in 20 years. Those students are not getting access to and completing higher education at the same level as others. So we're looking at all four of these things, learning, completion, labor market, and equity, and we believe that you have to do them together in order to be excellent. And so we're looking for colleges that are both achieving high levels of performance and improving over time. And so some people will say with the, with the, the prize, well, you know, in our context, we're not sure that the, what's possible. Well, this just shows you across, in terms of completion rates, what is possible. The finalist average is 53%. The top three average each year is at 64%. And some people will say, well, that's in, in what contexts are those? Well, here's Valencia College, the winner of the prize in the first year. Valencia is a college of 60,000 students on four campuses in Orlando. It's 30-something percent white. Uh, it's 30-something uh, percent Hispanic, 16% African American. So it's about half, a little under half, um, uh, underrepresented minority students. And this is what they achieved between the year 2007-8 and 2013-14, an 84% increase over six years in associates of arts degrees, uh, a 46% increase in certificates and diplomas, and in applied associates, it was a 66% increase. Um, they had a 40% increase in enrollment over that period, Nationally, what we see is that when enrollment goes up, actually graduation rates go down. Their rate was going up substantially over that period of time. So this is what's possible in a context that I think a lot of people would say is as or more challenging than most community colleges. What's possible in terms of equity? Well, we see colleges that are achieving 50% success rates for their non-white students, underrepresented minority students. Um, and what about labor market outcomes? So I think this is really important. We've been able to capture the post-graduation success of students by matching the records of your graduates with unemployment insurance data from the state level. We see what the earnings are. And if you look at, uh, you know, in urban and rural settings alike, look at Brazosport College. This is a college where the average worker, when the average new hire in the region earns $31,000, they've been able to achieve a $57,000 average for students in the year after graduating. Some people say, well, a lot of our students transfer, the year after graduating isn't the right number. Well, let's look five years after graduating. Let's look at Miami-Dade, which is a more transfer-oriented college. The average worker in their region earns $46,000. The average Miami-Dade graduate five years after graduating is earning $63,000 a year. So we know that these things are possible. And by the way, Miami-Dade, again, largest community college in the country, uh, huge numbers of students who 
are English language learners. I mean, what they're achieving and is, is remarkable for the graduates they have. So, so how do they do it? That's really the question. And what we hope um, to, to share with people, uh, and really are doing a lot of work with colleges now and systems, um, and, and building it into a curriculum for the next generation of community college leaders, we're trying to build a curriculum around what we've learned great community colleges do. So here are the lessons. Here are the five strong themes we see that exist. And we bring experts with us to all of these site visits. Here are the, the themes. Strong leadership and vision. Clear pathways to credentials with, with supports. We've heard guided pathways. It really is what we're seeing happening in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about each of these. Third, intentional focus on improving teaching and learning. This is not enough part of the national conversation. We're talking about completion, but we're not talking enough about engaging faculty and improving teaching and learning. Fourth, consistent, systematic, and strategic use of data. This is not collection of data. It's about data use. And then finally, it is really about partnerships. I was delighted to see that in the opening here. Uh, it's about new structures with four-year colleges, with K-12, with employers, with community-based organizations. These are the five themes that we've seen uh, organically across the institutions with the highest and, and fastest improving levels of student success. So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, the, the, these colors we need to change, it's the same, the same color scheme. But, these are the five qualities of exceptional presidents. And I'm not going to uh, harp on this a lot, I'd spend a lot of time on this. I will say that we have a crisis and opportunity report which lays these out. I think as you're thinking about advancing into leadership, uh, or if you're serving on search committees for presidents at institutions, uh, those of you who are engaged in, 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 in other contexts, um, here are the qualities we've seen of exceptional presidents. I will say two things. One is we don't do a good enough job of valuing um, uh, what, what actually I think is very clear here in my conversations with Ken that, um, that, he, that he has. One is this notion of a willingness to take risks. Being able to say not enough students are succeeding is risky. Lots of college leaders will go out and tout their institution. It's a fine line you're walking, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta recruit students, you gotta recruit businesses, you gotta recruit partners, so you can't say, oh, things are terrible, right? And you also want people to understand that this isn't about blame, right? It's not anybody's fault that we are where we are. But you've got to be willing to take the risk of saying things aren't going well, and there will be obstacles that, um, that have to be pushed through. Higher education is relatively conservative um, as a set of institutions. That has huge uh, benefits. Um, we, we resist uh, political influence. We are clear about what we want for our students. It also makes change hard. And so leaders understanding that culture, working with people to bring them along and taking risks along the way. The second is this internal change management ability. Um, there's a pretty well-developed literature around change management in business. Um, in healthcare in recent years, it's been phenomenal. In higher ed, we haven't really developed that. And what we see are these folks around there, Sandy Shugart um, at Valencia, Barbara Vizi at West Kentucky, are really remarkable at change management, about, uh, about creating urgency, inspiring people to move ahead, a real, real growth mindset, um, investing in their people, uh, that set of things. Those are the two elements that we think are probably most missing um, in, in colleges that are, uh, that are not, uh, or, or most notable in the colleges that are achieving high and improving levels of student success. So our second theme is about clear pathways to credentials and other intentional support structure. So the idea here basically, and you've all heard this before probably, and Davis Jen Jenkins uh, from Community College Research Center is speaking eloquently about this now. I think there's a real convergence in the field that the way we've, allow the, the way we've grown higher education is not really conducive to, actually I would say anybody's success, but particularly uh, uh, low-income uh, students and first-gen students, students who don't have the, um, who are working full-time or part-time, who are coming to our institutions underprepared, um, and who have no social capital, who have no, no family history or anybody to turn to to help them navigate what are now pretty crooked pathways to a degree. So, you know, in the 60s and 70s, community colleges and higher education in the country grew enormously. And the way we grew it is just by adding courses. We just added more courses. We said, we've got more students. Who wants to teach what? I know that's a little bit of a caricature, but we did move away from 
having these pretty specific pathways to a degree with clear requirements to course catalogs with 1,000 plus courses, 150 degree programs. And the problem is that all of the social science that we've been learning over the last 30 years tells us people don't do very well with that kind of unguided choice. They just don't. I would ask you to look, do you have a, an honors program here? Is your honors program prescribed in terms of the courses that you take? Are there limited numbers of courses on the honors track? Right? So it's really interesting that in honors programs we say, here are the courses that make you an honors student. We're willing to limit what those folks do, but for everybody else we're going to give you a catalog and we'll send you a council, we'll figure that out. Um, and I know that's a bit of a caricature. I know, I'm sure you're doing lots of work to help students get on a path, but across higher ed, these are sort of very different things. People often say to me, well, why, should, why shouldn't our students have um, sort of this unfettered choice? And you know, I ask them about their honors programs, and invariably you see that they're structured. Uh, Harvard now, Harvard University now has five pathways that you go down in your first year. You, you, you know, there's a limited number of courses that, that are uh, aligned to different areas of study. They're telling you what to do. So this is not about, um, th this is not about uh, certain kinds of students being guided and others not. This really is about our moving away from a system of clear pathways. So what does it mean to build a pathway? Well, one is it's, it's, it's really, narrowly defined course sequences. Um, uh, I, it's, it's about coming together and saying, this is what it means to get a, a degree in social sciences, broadly narrowing down to what you would need for pre-psychology or, or narrowing down into what you would need for a transfer into a business administration program. Um, but it's really trying to figure out what are the, the, the course sequences. And then it's about building high impact support services around that. So it's about early alerts, making sure students are staying on path, making sure they have the skills needed to make it through the path, intervening, intrusively intervening when they're not. But it really means all of your systems, advising, registration, tutoring, the guidance that you get in note taking and student success courses, career counseling, all of your systems are designed, really trying to be considered along uh, with that pathway. So it's not about advising students um, uh, to navigate what may be a um, somewhat opaque system, but it's about completing a clearer pathway. Um, it is also about new systems uh, from scratch that help students with social, sort of the social things that they need, right? Uh, single stop centers, um, you know, the, the ability, getting students uh, the financial aid they need, but also all of the social services. Our students have really complicated lives, and so you can't just be thinking about academic pathways uh, academic supports, you have to think about social supports as well. Um, and then finally, um, uh, it is about starting with the end in mind. One thing I will say is that these pathways need to be aligned to what comes next, either the workforce or to four-year colleges. And we've seen a couple of colleges start down the pathways design, but keeping all of the programs that they have in mind. One of the things that can, is important is to make sure those pathways uh, are leading to what comes next. Um, you know, excellent leaders that we've talked to, many colleges have said the college isn't a destination, it's a path from something to something. And that if you realize where students are coming from and where they're going, you'll design your pathways in a way that helps them succeed. So what are examples of that? Well, Miami-Dade College, the largest college in the country, and one of the uh, five top placers in the prize. The first year has been engaged for several years in pathways design. 80% of the students at Miami-Dade, largest community college in the country, 80% of the students enter and are put on a path for a full-time or a part-time schedule with defined course sequences. Uh, that, they just moved from 55% to 80% this year. Um, and it's really fascinating how they got there. Now, we don't have the results from Miami-Dade yet, but we do from Florida State. Florida State has been at this for a long time in the four-year sector, and they moved from 44 to 64% graduation rates in uh, less than a decade. So they, they saw a rapid improvement, and really they attribute that. They did other things, but they attribute that to Pathways. So Miami-Dade's interesting because I think a lot of people, when they started this work, um, said, well, uh, uh, students want the choice they have 
they're really going to rebel against this. So they actually met with uh, 900 students from every uh, part of the college. They didn't just have a little focus group of 15 students. They met with 900 students, and they had 300 people meeting with them. So 300 people across the college were meeting with these students and hearing what was happening. And across all of the programs, from even their honors program, which is not as structured as some others, to students who started in developmental education and everything in between, uh, career technical education to gen ed, the students said, you know, they asked them what the biggest problem was, and they said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what courses to take. I'm taking the wrong courses. Now, there's no wrong course in some sense. You learn something, right? But it's, it's an opportunity cost. You take a course that doesn't lead you on the path to a degree, right? And you could be on one that does. And the students were incredibly clear. Um, and I think there is a lesson there, which is if you really listen to students, they're going to tell you that um, this notion that students don't do optional, that Kay McClenney always talks about, how if you make things optional for students, uh, they're not going to choose it. Actually, if you talk to students, they'll say, tell me what to do. I, I don't have the time to make mistakes. I need to be told what to do. There is a little bit of a romantic idea that if we tell students what to do, they're not learning how to navigate their own lives, right? That in a sense, what college is about is a bridge to work. But I don't know many employers who say, show up when you want. Do you? Right? I don't know many employers who say, what would you like to be doing at work? Do you? Right? So, and we don't do that in high school either. We say, show up to class, right? In, in K-12. So why is the bridge between K-12 and work, oh, here you got to figure this out, right? I was just at Carnegie and I listened to Angela Duckworth. Anybody been following her work on grit? Angela Duckworth's work on grit. If you haven't read the Carol Dweck book, Mindset, I'd strongly recommend it to you because it's a phenomenal discussion of how we can actually teach grit. But, but I got to tell you, giving students a catalog with 150 programs and 1,000 courses and helping them navigate through that is not going to teach grit. Because what they're going to learn is, I can take the wrong course or I can make mistakes and, and then we, I, I, I just don't know how that's helping them. So at Miami-Dade, they've, they've been going down this path and they're starting to see very strong early results on retention, very strong early results. Uh, we'll see at the end of this year they'll have their first graduation rate cohort done. Second example, Lake Area Technical Institute, 76% graduation rate. Now this is a technical college with 30 defined career and technical programs. And you come in and they work really hard with you to pick the right program. They make sure it's aligned with your preparation level as well as your goals and with a job at the back end. They have almost 100% employment rate and very strong labor market outcomes. And you decide on that and that's the last choice you made. There are no course choices. Um, and students just follow this path in cohorts. Uh, the professors know who they are. They have other things that are really powerful. You know, you have to get out of the classroom within two weeks. There's a rule there. You can't have students learning theory for more than two weeks in the classroom. You've got to get them doing hands-on work out in the field. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that there's some lessons there across to the general education side as well. Um, I think people are realizing that, that, the, 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 that adult learning is really benefited by the intersection between theory and practice, that you have to have application. Uh, but this is really powerful, and, um, and it is a block scheduled. You come in at 8 in the morning, and you're done at 2.30. They have 50% Pell students, folks. I mean, this is, they're not creaming. And I was actually the commencement speaker there, and I shook the hands of the 800 students who came across the stage. And these are not, these are not students who were otherwise headed to the University of South Dakota. These are students who, for whom this is the only option, and 76% are graduating. Um, the last example, actually I have two more. One is Santa Fe College. So Santa Fe is a more traditional uh, uh, designed uh, set of uh, programs, but the way they have built pathways is uh, technology-based. So they're guiding students, but they have a way of registering for courses that the likes of which I've not quite seen. Um, actually, Arizona State and Maricopa now have this partnership on transfer. But when you want to register for courses at Santa Fe, you get on a computer, and the first question they ask is, when can you take classes? 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, morning, afternoon, or evening. Check the boxes in each, which of those 21 boxes work for you. It's like going out to Expedia to get a flight, right? What day do you want to go? Then they walk through, and you, you, you know, when you get on, they push you, and the advisors are pushing you to pick a major, right? And if you know what college you want to transfer to, they're pushing you in that direction as well. Then comes up a list of courses, not all the courses available, but the courses available next semester that fit within the schedule you just said. So they've already narrowed it down, and they say you, you, know, you, have, you have nine units in this area, you need three more units in this area. Here are the three classes that will fit that. Nothing else is shown to you. You don't see the rest of the catalog. You walk through and you click all the classes you might be interested in, and then you say, show me schedules. And just like Expedia, it gives you 20 options. Here are the options of the various iterations of the schedules you can have that fit with the times you can go and what you need to graduate and transfer it with junior standing in a four-year college. And then when you pick the one you want, you say register and all you gotta do is go pay. Um, now, students who are um, on probation or underprepared, you know, they, they may have to see an advisor. But think about that technology as a way of helping guide students and think about the potential cost savings associated with that. It's another way of thinking about a pathway of building a cl clarity for students in what otherwise might be a fairly opaque system. Finally, I'd like to mention in, in your backyard is Kennedy King College, which has tripled graduation rates in the last five years. Now, they started at a low level in single digits, right? So, um, but they're now about at the national average if you look at what uh, what we're seeing. Um, it, uh, we have not seen that kind of increase. And I'll just tell you a story. You know, they've created pathways. So if you look at their catalog, get on their, the City Colleges of Chicago catalog, it's, it's pathways with defined course sequences. And I'll tell you the story when we went to visit. Because of improvement largely, they made our, our list of 10 finalists this year for the prize. And we've never seen that kind of rate of improvement. Um, Valencia at a large college level, starting from a higher point, I think is the fastest improvement we've seen. Um, uh, it's actually the, the, the graduation rates for their full-time students has tripled overall, it's doubled in the last five years. But, but we met with two groups of students and, and one group of students were uh, student leaders. We always meet with student leaders because if we ask to meet with students, that's what colleges want to give us, <laughs> right? You want to bring your best students, but we also know they're not going to be the ones who have the typical experience and so at the same time, we're meeting with students who started in developmental education. Um, now there's some overlap sometimes, but we really, they don't have to be in developmental education, but it has to be a separate group of students. And these are pretty big groups of students. And so we ask a series of questions. We often ask, how did you choose your course of study? Who helped you? And then we ask, you know, has the path been clear for you? Has it worked for you? And with the student leader group, the majority of them, 75% of them had taken a wrong course. These are the student leaders. These are literally the students who you would expect to be the most on top of things, most connected to the institution. 75% of them had taken a course out of their course sequence. And we, we push on that and we say, well, did you change majors? No, no, I knew what I wanted to do, or I stayed on the same path, or I was undecided. But, but I, you know, it was very clear that the guidance, and it's fascinating because these students always start by lauding their college. You know, we're there for the prize, right? We're there. And they want to talk about how great the college is, and, and, and it's genuine. And then they get into this, and, and you know, we've had to calm students down at times because they start getting mad because they learn somebody got guidance or figured it out and another one didn't, and they, why is this? They really start getting mad. So, so that's the student leaders. And then I was, I was in that group, and my colleagues were with the other group of students who started in developmental education, and um, only one of them was still in dev ed. They, but they, they all had started later than, the, than the, the student leader group, right? The student leader group were all about to graduate. These students had started later, and none of them had taken a wrong course. None of them. Why? Because they started later and the pathways were in place. So again, listen to students. I think you're really going to find, I mean, it was remarkable to us. The other powerful thing about this on the learning side is, um, and we heard this enough to believe it to be true, when you started to talk to the faculty from English to history to science, they say that the students have a better sense of why they're there. 
They understand that what they're taking is aligned. They can see themselves on a path. And they actually said even the conversations were just better. Right? They saw in English that there was a connection to their program of study. So that's pathways. Uh, third, intentional focus on improving teaching and learning. Um, what does this look like? Um, faculty are engaged in self-assessment and eager to improve instruction. Uh, we all, always ask when we go onto college campuses, how do you know students are learning? Some people will say, well, I'm, I'm with them in their classes. I grade their papers. Yeah, but how do you know they're learning? You've got 30 students in a classroom. How do you know they're learning? Well, when you go onto campuses where they've had a, they have a deep culture of faculty um, engaging in the measurement and improvement of student learning, it's very authentic, and this is what you see. Um, explicit connections are being made between individual student learning and programs of study. So people, uh, faculty really understand why they're teaching what they're teaching. At West Kentucky, they had a huge problem, even in the uh, pathway in English, where the folks in uh, English 101 and the folks in developmental uh, education were pointing fingers at each other. You know, you're not preparing students for our class. And so they actually got them all together and they found that, you know, dev ed, dev ed faculty were teaching to here in English 101 wanted students to start here, right? And then they got them together and they, they had them all read the same English papers and grade them. And, and they had them uh, 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 write down the three things that were strong and weak about students and they realized they were grading for completely different things. Some of them cared more about grammar, some about sentence structure, some about conveying ideas, radically different things. And they realized, you know, the leaders then stood up and said, okay, is it okay that students' English preparation, their ability to write, depends on who they happen to have as a professor? Is that okay? Is it okay that if they had Mrs. Thompson, they had really good grammar, but if they had um, Mrs. Smith, uh, they didn't, but they might be better at writing for meaning. Is that okay? What do we want students to do? Well, across West Kentucky now, fast forward a decade, every program is using common assessment tools, common rubrics, and they're even looking at the grading and success of students by professor and comparing notes. So professors are saying to each other, I didn't, my students didn't do very well on grammar, Who's di who did better than that? In, in, in department meetings, I did. Great, how did you do that? Can I come observe your classroom? This is the stuff of engagement. And I will tell you a lot of professors, when you start this work, you know, there's sort of this lore that it's gonna be about top-down, um, uh, uh, be about top-down telling, you know, bubble tests and standards. They love it when they are engaged in it. At Valencia and West Kentucky, the, the most faculty engaged places we've seen, which have seen uh, growth in graduation rates, and they will attribute it to this. It, 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 faculty are really engaged. Um, they are systematically using evidence, as I mentioned, uh, to drive uh, learnings and improvement. The other thing is that there are systems aligned, actually tenure, promotion, professional development systems. I mean, professional development in the community colleges that I've seen, you know, very often it's, it's a committee getting together and saying, what do we think we need to know? And we send people off to conferences and maybe they come back and report. Um, it's sort of a first come, first serve basis. Um, but, but at West Kentucky, they decided in their QEP process for a SACS accreditation, their quality enhancement plan, they decided it was all about reading. Students don't read for meaning. And so all of their professional development dollars went towards it. And by the way, some of, it, some of their dollars they used for a benchmark reading assessment that's given to all students, uh, to a sample of students every year to see whether students are reading for meaning. Faculty got together and said this. And so now if you look at their professional development budget, it's moved, it's grown a lot, but it's moved from something that a committee decides to every faculty member today, everyone, science teachers, math teachers, everybody, is trained on how to teach reading. Uh, they're t trained on note taking through Cornell Notes. They're trained on the methods of excellent reading. And guess what? Their, their benchmark has gone from the 40s to the 80s, the 80-something percentile in uh, the, the norming on, on reading across community colleges because they're working together. Um, and so you see these systems that are aligned to goals for the college. Um, so I've described a little bit uh, these two colleges. Uh, Santa Barbara City College also 
um, has really aligned, one thing I'd add to this, is they've aligned their hiring practices to their learning goals. So um, if, you're, if you think that growth mindset really matters, right? Folks know what growth mindset is as opposed to the fixed mindset idea, right? So if you believe that, the, that, that people's brains, that, that, that hiring people who believe that students can actually get smarter, right? That it's not a fixed intelligence, but you can actually help them get smarter, then you hire for that. And there are ways of looking at resumes and there are ways of putting criteria in hiring practices that align to, you know, if this is one of our learning goals for students, we're going to put that into our hiring practices. Um, on the technical side, I think teaching and learning often is about bringing people in from industry. And Lake Area Tech and some other colleges we've seen um, are really good at sort of the onboarding and pedagogical training for folks in the career and technical education area. Uh, fourth theme um, is uh, consistent, systematic, and strategic use of data. Uh, there's a guy named Charlie Blaich uh, who's here at Wabash College. Anybody ever heard of his work? It's the Center for the Inquiry in Liberal Arts. Um, so it's, it's small liberal arts colleges. Uh, but he is very much interested in how do you get colleges to use data. And so he's had these demonstration projects where he's worked for three or four years with fellows, provosts, deans, others at colleges, to come in and make a plan for data use and then um, uh, work with people who come in twice a year in cohorts. And I went and sat through a three-day session. They did posters and they talked to each other and strategizing. And at the end of this period, they, they, um, uh, they had 27 colleges involved and three of them had made some progress in data use that showed some results. Um, we, we've moved in, in higher education. Accreditors are telling us you have to gather information about learning. Uh, we have moved to trying to uh, gather information about um, completion, uh, but there's lots of uh, challenges in terms of data use. So what does it look like to use data? So one is that, 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 that a, a limited data set are, are distributed consistently across the college. Uh, the best story we have about this is Sandy Shugart, who came into Valencia College, and um, he was talking about completion, and everybody wanted to talk about the um, enrollment reports, basically these reports that that said uh, um, productivity reports is what I think they were called. But basically they were about, productivity was entirely about based on enrollment. And so he called IR and said just stop delivering them. Stop. There are two really important lessons. Here are the reports. Let's talk about the completion reports we can deliver. Let's talk about the reports that we want to focus on. There are two important things there. One is he realized that um, in a sense, as he said, you have to slay the old data, uh, the old systems, the old incentives, in order to create new ones. Um, it's very hard to keep layering on more and more measures for folks. Um, and, and if there is a, a, a focus and a set of incentives people have now that, um, that you think is distracting them from the next set, it may, may be just for a few years getting rid of those. But it's got to be a limited uh, data set, and it's got to be distributed consistently. Um, it, it, it really does um, a, a align to what comes next. So we, we are seeing colleges that are looking at labor market outcomes. Um, Walla Walla Community College, I know Steve Van Osdell meant to be here. Um, they're distributing labor market outcomes that are uh, both the real-time data and the long-term data to folks to say, you know, are students getting good jobs? Um, and if not, why? Uh, the story out of Walla Walla is closing the culinary arts program when it was fully enrolled. Closing a fully enrolled program, right? Why? Because they looked at the data and students were not earning good wages in the job. They were getting jobs, by the way. This is not only a fully enrolled program, but a program that put people in jobs, but they were earning close to minimum wage jobs. And so they went out to talk to the students, right? Data don't give you the answer, they raise the questions. Well, why are our students, they're enrolled in the program, they're graduating, they're getting jobs, and then they're not earning wages. So they went out to talk to people and you know, they, were, they were not happy. They couldn't support their families, they were working the night shift, they were chopping vegetables, they were not fulfilling their dreams of being a chef or a cook. They found some people who actually did do well. They found some people who were doing things like running small catering businesses. They found a graduate who had helped, uh, helped start and grow a, 
a program to glean um, from local, from, from farms, glean vegetables and fruit, can them and give them to homeless shelters. I was earning a decent living doing that and was quite fulfilled. Um, so they, they tried to get the head of the program to change what was going on, didn't work very well, they shut the program. They said, we're not offering a program where we're holding out for students that they're gonna get jobs and we know there's demand for it, but this program ain't doing it. Now they reopened it three years later and what did they reopen it around? They bought, they bought an excess food truck from the state. Why the state owned a food truck, I'm not sure. Uh, but they, they, they bought an excess food truck and they taught students how to not just cook, but how to run a small business. They opened a catering service that now services folks in the local area. So they were teaching them the front of the house skills and the business skills that are needed to be successful. But it started because they saw from the data after students graduated whether they were succeeding. This is really important, which is faculty and staff need to be given structured time to come up with a theory for why the data say what the data say and a strategy for how they're gonna move forward. You know, this is, this is, the, this is what's needed for, right? You, you gotta look at the data, come up with an idea, implement it, and then evaluate whether it worked. But it's important that that idea really be generated by the folks who are gonna be doing the work, that they have a role to play in doing that. And I think um, uh, th that is because the data aren't gonna tell you the single answers, number one. And number two, change management science, I think, generally tells us that fear is not a great motivator, uh, but, but uh, seeing opportunity and understanding where you're going is an important part. Uh, if you really want people's heart and souls in the work, they need to understand what the theory is. Um, so um, uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, of Valencia. Let, let me, let me uh, uh, close with this last piece, which is the notion of integrated structures uh, for the benefit of students. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that I think in higher ed is that we're in silos, right? Our K-12 systems are preparing students and they come to us and if they're underprepared, we then go on to try to remediate the, 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 the failure of the K-12 system uh, or of students during that period of time. And similarly, we work with them in the community college sector and then we send them off to the four-year college and the four-year colleges may say, oh, they don't really have what they, what they need. Um, really, this is, uh, uh, it's important to think not just about partnership, but integrated structures. Students, they experience these silos, and at every stage in the silo, we lose huge numbers of students. Nationally, 80% of community college students enter reporting that they want a bachelor's degree. Anybody know how many get one? Percentage of entering community college students who get a bachelor's degree? 15, 17%. You want to talk about a leak in a pipeline? We're talking about millions of students who come in wanting one thing. Now, are 80% knowledgeable about that? Should it be maybe it's 60, 70%? I don't know. But the majority want a bachelor's degree and they're not getting one. Why? Well, some of it has to do with the fact that we have misaligned expectations between two and four-year schools. We have credit transfer loss between two and four-year schools. We have poor advising for students about where to go because they have to now make a new decision after a two-year degree, right? If we can blend those structures, we can find ways to fix things. And in fact, I talk about Harper's work in K-12. It's one of the examples I'm now using across the country to talk to people about what that looks like in terms of integrating the structures between K-12 and a community college. When it comes from the community college to um, uh, so I'll, I'll, so, so the, the, the four organizational types that we see community colleges working with most are K-12, four-year colleges in these new structures, employers, and community-based organizations. Each of those organizational types can do something you can't do as well alone. In the, you know, students are not gonna wander across your campus the way they're wandering into the goodwill. Right? They're just not. And if you want to give students access to a higher education, part of the mission, you've got to start working with the places where they are and providing short-term training. Um, you, no matter how, what kind of applied work you do, cannot fully simulate a work environment. You can't. Right? I mean, and, and to try to do that across all the workforces is foolhardy. So blended skills development, where students are getting real-time 
um, uh, uh, skills on the job while they're in school give you those opportunities. Um, uh, so let me just talk about what we've seen and where, um, what that looks like. I, the, the industry connection at Lake Area Tech with the programs is phenomenal. They have, industry believes that Lake Area Tech is a supply chain of human capital for those industries. I mean, there's no other way to say it. The industry is fully bought into the idea. So FedEx, I don't, this FedEx is not in South Dakota. They talk about hiring more pilot, uh, more airplane mechanics out of Lake Area Tech than any place else. It's a school of 2,000 students. Um, across in, industry to industry, 3M loves these guys. They love them because they're delivering the workers they need. But why are they delivering the workers they need? Well, one is they've gone to the industry and really said, we want to work with you. The second is that these industry councils, that they're not just meeting every two, three, four times a year. They're really involved. They're advising students. They're walking through the program. They invite them into the program a couple times a year and say, please walk through while students are working and tell us if what we're doing is aligned to what the industry needs. The industry, and so they're donating equipment. Um, FedEx flew a 747 that they were ready to retire onto the Lake Area campus and parked it there and said, this is for your students. Little college in the middle of Water Watertown, South Dakota. Why did they choose them? Supply chain. They understood that this was the place that they were getting workers. Um, and uh, so, so that's what a, a partnership looks like. Um, Walla Walla as well, I've talked a little bit about their work with industry. The story of Walla Walla is very much a story of a reinvention of a, an economy. Um, in 1999, when NAFTA had resulted in lots of high-value agricultural production moving to Mexico, so asparagus and things that required a lot of manual labor, um, they were left with um, uh, garbanzo beans and things that dried beans that they were shipping to the Middle East. Lots of jobs shrank. And so they looked at the labor market data and they saw that nursing was really going to be needed. And they went out to talk to all the regional hospitals hours away and talked about whether they were getting what they needed and they convinced the state to invest heavily and they doubled the size of the nursing program. For a college their size of 8,000 students, I think the nursing program proportionately is the biggest around and it's producing people that are going all across the state now. The other thing they realized though is not a lot of people, a lot of people were not going to go into nursing and a lot of the people who used to work in agriculture weren't. And so they um, looked and talked to the industry in the area, and they decided to make a big bet on wine growing, on grape growing and wine making. And um, they had seven vineyards at the time in 1999 when they started this. They built the first community college enology and viticulture center. Fast forward to, the, to today, there are 200 vineyards, wine tasting rooms all over downtown. They've reinvented a rural, small town economy, unlike any story I've ever heard. Um, but it came in partnership with, uh, with the businesses. They got the businesses to come with them to the governor uh, and, and, get an, and, and to businesses to get an investment in the Enology Center. Um, they've consistently done this in partnership. I, I spent some time there both for the prize, they, they were co-winner of the prize in the second year, but also uh, for the chapter in my book on labor market outcomes. And I was trying to tease out the role of the community college. What did the community college, because everybody said the community college was vitally important for building human capital, but it was really hard to tease the role out because everything was we went, we did. It, it was really phenomenal. It's truly integrated and has helped build this economy and there's a sense now of everybody being in it together. Um, their, their unemployment rate has come down. Their wage rates are phenomenal. And it's not, not that many people graduate from the Enology program, uh, uh, but, but when they do, they're starting their own vineyards so they're bringing people from all across the country who are buying land, going through the program, starting vineyards. They're second in that region only to um, Napa Valley now for wine production in the country. Uh, and they've had a lot to do with it. And, and, um, but the spin-offs are phenomenal. RailX, which is a, a refrigerated rail car sir, uh, that, that ships wine, um, it, it, it doesn't make stops. And it goes from there to someplace in New York and someplace in Florida. Um, and so they're building a huge warehouse there because of the winemaking. So think about the spin-off there. The number of catering services, they, wine tourists spend two and a half times the amount that other tourists do. And so they're coming in and spending huge amounts of money. And you imagine all the spin-off that mm -hmm. comes from that, millions of dollars across a weekend. 
Um, so there are other common denominators uh, across these colleges. I, um, I don't want to get into all the details. I can leave that up for those to look at, uh, but I think I'm right about at time. Um, and we wanted to, um, I, I'm not sure what the next step, steps are. There was a panel and, right. um, and perhaps some questions. But, but there are other things. There's a couple I'll, I'll mention. Student success is the college's core business. Students are not blamed for gaps in success. This is really important. A lot of the, this notion that students have the right to fail, we need to give students the right to fail, is not language you hear frequently, if at all, on these high-performing college campuses. It's very much about what can we do to help students. It's not that students don't have a role in this. I think everybody realizes that. But if students are failing, the question always is, what can we do to enable them to succeed, including in helping them become more self-efficacious? Right? It's not just about holding their hands. Um, and uh, um, I think the, the other is a, a real honesty and openness about the need to improve. Um, I was delighted to hear uh, Ken talk about um, how uh, Harper deserves the prize <laughs> earlier. Um, and, and really, I think the thing that probably signifies colleges that are, um, that are winning the prize the most is that they really have among the best student success rates in the country, and they're not satisfied. They know that they can get better. They know that all students can succeed, and that there's always a next stage that they can push towards, and their cultures are designed. People at the college really understand that and are working towards it. Um, these are some publications. Um, I mentioned the book. Harvard Ed Press has a bug in my ear. If I don't say this, I'm going to get shocked. Um, mm. uh, I, I have a book out uh, uh, called What Excellent Community Colleges Do um, that's available on Amazon. All of the other publications are free, however, so they probably don't like that I say that. Mm. Um, although What Excellent Community Colleges Do is a great value, please. Um, uh, so, but all of these are available on our website, and uh, I'll leave these up so you can see what, the, uh, what we've got available. Um, so thanks very much, and um, I'll turn it back to, I'm not right. sure. I'm over here. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Josh. Great job. Great job.